five-layer graphing, which is just a, a slightly more complicated system, but uh, in I believe to be a much richer uh, system. So first, I'm just gonna uh, summarize very quickly what we did yesterday. So yesterday we talked about uh, monolayer graphing, how to open an energy gap in monolayer graphing. We did this by aligning uh, boronitride and uh, graphene. We can see the signatures of uh, this alignment in the transport measurements. We can see it by two means. The first one is the appearance of a satellite peak. When the Fermi energy crosses the satellite peak in the Fermi in the energy band structure, and uh, also by the opening of an energy gap at the charge neutrality point and at the satellite peak. Uh, these measurements, as I told you yesterday, they are 300 k, and that's why we don't see the opening of the energy gap. But if we go to low temperatures, and we do this for several alignments, we can uh, easily extract what's uh, the energy gap for uh, all the all the spectrum of alignments of graphene on, uh, on the end. So as I told you before, while the charge neutrality point uh, behaves a little bit, uh, let's say in an oscillatory fashion, uh, the satellite peak behaves uh, much uh, in a predictable way. It closes uh, far from alignment. It opens to its maximum at uh, full alignment. And it's this uh, energy gap and this breaking of inversion symmetry what uh, allow us to see the anomalous velocity generated by the very curvature. This very curvature in analogy, in analogy with the magnetic field can be viewed as a magnetic field, but this time in the momentum space. And it has, uh, as a consequence, an induced valley conductivity which in the case of monolayer and only for monolayer graphing, it has a value that is quantized uh, inside the gap, uh, when Fermi energy is inside the energy gap, and it decreases very fast uh, away from the, from the energy gap or from the charge neutrality point. So unfortunately, this valley hole uh, cannot be directly, it's not a direct observable, it cannot be measured directly, but we have other quantities as a non-local resistance that can be uh, measured uh, in just an experiment. And uh, the way we measure this non-local resistance is we apply a current in uh, these two leads, normally without the very curvature and without this uh, contribution of the valley hole uh, conductivity. The carrier should go straight from one electron to the other in the case of a breaking of inversion symmetry, an energy gap in a very curvature, uh, an important very curvature, we will have electrons or carriers going, uh, belonging to one valley going to one direction and the ones belong to the other valley going to the opposite direction. So this is called the valley hole effect. In the other side of our sample, we have the inverse <laughs> valley hole effect, which will create a charge accumulation in one of our electrodes, and that will be uh, the origin of our non-local signal. Uh, we also, just to recap very quickly, uh, we also saw some experiments performed by the Manchester group on this uh, subject where they use aligned and non-aligned samples to demonstrate that uh, it's really the presence of the energy gap that creates this uh, uh, non-local signals. Uh, they show that the ohmic contribution is very small, so this is not just uh, electrons or carriers going around uh, the sample because the electrodes are uh, far enough. And they also observe uh, this cubic relation, or uh, not directly but indirectly, this uh, cubic relation of the non-local resistance with the local uh, with the local resistance, and extrapolate uh, that. Uh, the non-local resistance, the dependence of their non-local resistance as a function of the length of the sample uh, will extrapolate at zero length to the quantum of, uh, of conductance, so two square over h, which is the value that we should observe uh, in this valley hole conductivity. Now, this is 
this was the first work about it. Uh, later on, two groups, uh, a Japanese group and uh, a group of Cambridge University, uh, measure the same kind of, uh, they perform the same kind of experiments this time in higher quality uh, graphing, because this graphing is fully encapsulated and uh, they observe what seems to be uh, the transport through ballistic channels. And in fact, uh, they, they claim to see a quantization of the resistance to two square over H, uh, once again. And uh, this, this is the signature of uh, a conduction made uh, by edges, by, uh, by the edges of the, the sample. Uh, now, if you see this cubic relation between the non-local and the local resistance, which is at the end of the day, one of the main tools we have to really distinguish topological uh, valley currents or uh, non-topological valley currents. In fact, uh, for low temperatures, uh, very low temperatures, this uh, do not follow, their measurements do not follow this quadratic uh, relation, but as they increase the temperature, they start to see this uh, restitution of this uh, cubic, sorry, it's not quadratic, it's cubic relation. So this is a monolayer. So far, a uh, few experiments showing that uh, there is not a clear conclusion if this might be a, a bulk or an edge effect, but it seems to be that we are going somewhere in terms of uh, finally separating valley currents that might be used in, in future balletronics experiments. So today we're gonna uh, move just slightly uh, away from, uh, from that, we are still talking about valley topological currents. So we still have a system where we can open a gap, but it's a different system. In this case, we are talking about bilayer graphing. Uh, this is just AB or Bernal stack bilayer graphing. So standard, there is no twist between the two graphing uh, layers, okay? So we all know uh, bilayer graphing by now. We all know it's a band structure. Bilayer graphing, it's a, a very interesting system, uh, a subject that is very interesting uh, to me and that is, uh, let's say, also dear to my heart is the quantum hall effect and the different uh, uh, topological effects that you can observe. For example, in this case, we have, have even denominators that can only be observed in bilayer graphing or in monolayer graphing aligned with uh, poronitrite in very specific angles. Uh, this is just to, to show you that bilayer is in fact uh, one of the richest systems. We can have uh, very exotic states as these even denominators, fractional quantum hall states. Uh, we can have uh, a, a really uh, large solidity, solidity of uh, topological states uh, around. But uh, what concerns us today is how to open a gap in a bilayer graphic. So we know two ways to do this. We can either apply a displacement field, an out of plane uh, electric field that will create an asymmetry between the two layers, and it will open an energy gap. It has been already proved by ARPES, by electron transport, by every mean uh, possible in the world. And we can also uh, align bilayer graphene with poronitrite. And in this case, has been predicted to have uh, a very interesting band structure. Uh, these are Koshino and Moon's uh, uh, numerical simulations of the subject a few years ago, but it's also been uh, the numerical simulations has been reproduced recently uh, by an MIT group, uh, where they, in fact, they predict that uh, bilayer graphene, AB stack, bilayer graphene aligned with boronitride at zero alignment, it has the presence of uh, flat bands. And uh, there is even a paper claiming superconductivity in these systems, but uh, I'm not going to talk about uh, today. I'm not going to talk about that uh, today. I'm just talking about uh, the fact that uh, we can open an energy gap at the charge neutrality point and another gap at the satellite peak. So now uh, we have exactly the same effects when we break inversion symmetry in uh, monolayer or in uh, bilayer uh, graphene. So as 
I just told you before, we break inversion symmetry in bilayer graphing. Uh, this time, we have our uh, very curvature that will be different from zero as uh, because we don't have inversion, uh, special inversion symmetry anymore. This very curvature will give rise to an anomalous velocity, which means that our electrons will move uh, away from a straight trajectory. Our carriers will move away uh, from our straight trajectory. And they, this very curvature is opposite depending on the valley that the carriers belong to. So they will move uh, carriers belonging to K, will move in one direction, carriers belonging to K prime, they will move in the opposite direction, or so we think. Uh, sorry. And uh, as I just told you a few seconds ago, this will induce a whole uh, conductivity. In the case of uh, bilayer graphing, this whole conductivity will be different. It's uh, uh, because the uh, very phase of uh, bilayer graphing is 2 pi instead of pi. In the case of graphing, this valley hole uh, conductivity instead of being quantized to two square over h, as is the case of monolayer graphing, will be quantized to four e square over h. So once again, in, uh, in bilayer, the only tools that we have uh, to measure this, at least in transport, is a, a not direct measurement, a measurement of the non-local uh, resistance of the system. And uh, the phenomena in monolayer and bilayer are exactly the same. We will need the uh, valley hole and inverse valley hole effect to, to measure this. So the first results uh, concerning to that the, appear in the literature were in 2015 by a Japanese group uh, where they apply a displacement field as I told you before, you can open the energy gap in two ways, apply a displacement field or uh, align with boronitride. So in this case, they align, they align, sorry, they apply a displacement field. So as they increase this displacement field, you can see that the resistance at the charge neutrality point increases from uh, something very low, so they have about 20, uh, kilo ohms to 90 kilo ohms. This is a local measurement, okay? This is why uh, you can see it in this uh, drawing. At the same time, when they apply the same uh, range of displacement field, they can see a non-local resistance that is appearing at the same, uh, at the same moment as uh, we are uh, opening the gap and breaking the inversion symmetry. But you can notice the first thing is that our non-local resistance, it's a very high, it's a very high resistance. It goes up to 90 kilo ohms, while the non-local resistance, it's a very low. Uh, it only goes to about 60, uh, 600, sorry, 600 uh, ohms. So the uh, direct relation between the opening of the energy gap and the observation of this non-local uh, resistance led you to think that this might be uh, related to the breaking of uh, the inversion symmetry and the opening of this energy gap. And uh, in fact, if you see, once again, the ohmic contribution of their local resistance, it's really negligible compared to the non-local resistance is in fact four orders of magnitude smaller for one of the highest displacement field they, they apply. So, okay, this is good. Non-local resistance, we can observe it, we can play with them. That's the, the very good uh, conclusion of, uh, of, this, uh, of this paper is the, the fact that we can activate or disactivate this non-local resistance. But are they topological? Well, they try to answer this question about uh, the topology in the same way as uh, in the monolayer with the cubic relation. In fact, they find a cubic relation if, when they look at the uh, non-local resistance as a function of the local resistance, they found this cubic relation that seems to be the signature or the ultimate signature that we have to uh, demonstrate that uh, uh, Valley current or a non-local uh, uh, current 
it's really topological. However, the first thing that you have to notice in, in this um, plot that is very important is that this cubic relation, it's only observed for very low displacement fields. So I maybe this curve is a little bit um, difficult to understand in terms of what are we measuring here. So here they are just looking at this resistance and plotting this resistance versus this resistance for a given displacement field. So what it gives is that this is the low displacement field uh, regime, and this is the high displacement field regime. And you can see that the non-local resistance gets saturated in the high displacement field regime, where there is no uh, an apparent uh, reason for that. There is no a real a change, or at least it's not expected by theory, uh, a change in this uh, behavior. Later on, uh, Marco Polini in Italy made some uh, calculations uh, that might lead to the origin of this uh, saturation, but uh, it's still to in under debate because it doesn't match completely the experimental data. So, okay, they, they made a beautiful experiment. They can tune. Uh, Bali topological currents, let's say that at least in this regime, we can believe that they have uh, topological currents. We don't understand very well what happens after that, but they seem to, to be still in the topological uh, part. Then the second group uh, was working on the same subject exactly at the same time, apparently, uh, they published back to back, and uh, they got basically the same results, uh, still this cubic relation that we are going to see one over and over again. Uh, okay, so valid topological currents, uh, but the main question here is, are these uh, topological currents that propagate through the bulk, or do they propagate uh, through the edge of the sample? If they are really topologically protected, uh, we can have uh, both types of uh, topological uh, protection. It depends on, uh, on the bands of, uh, of your system. So they did what I consider it's a very clever uh, experiment. They measure non-local resistance as a function of, of the gate, so as a function of uh, the density of the system. So they apply a current through the middle of this device, and then they measure the non-local resistance in one side and the other side of the sun. And here you can see the left side and the right side, they have basically the same non-local resistance. So what's the point of this experiment and why I consider it so beautiful? If this was a, a edge effect, if this was a, an edge topological current, then the valley currents will have to go all around these very long arms that are not connected. This will mean that their amplitude, the left and right amplitude will be much different because, much different because the uh, valid topological uh, currents decay exponentially with length. In this case, they found uh, about the same uh, value of, uh, of resistance which uh, means that, in fact, the propagation, it's only on the bulk. So, okay, every, uh, every step of the way, we learn something new about these topological currents. Let's say that, okay, they follow a cubic relation, so we are in what we can uh, say it's a topological regime. Now we know that they seem to propagate on the, on the bulk uh, of the material. They are not edge topological currents which is also uh, a new information. Then a new group, uh, another Japanese group in uh, uh, Japan, <laughs> did uh, another experiment, uh, this time uh, using graphene, uh, bilayer graphene aligned with boron nitride. And well, this hasn't been done before, but it should give you, uh, in principle, as the origin of this uh, berry curvature and uh, of this breaking of inversion symmetry and the curvature is the same, you should have exactly the same uh, response as in the one aligned uh, with the displacement field, sorry. So they just perform the same kind of experiment, non-local experiments in H-bars. 
they observe oh, what they claim to be the valley hole effect and the inverse valley hole effect. And it's pretty much the same as uh, the other uh, papers. So we have strong non-local resistance. We have a cubic relation again, but once again, this cubic relation, it's last with uh, this time with temperature. Previous time was uh, with displacement field, making a stronger displacement field. And this time it's, uh, it's just lost with temperature, which is kind of a, of a puzzle. So in, in terms of uh, when we are talking about graphing a line with Vn, uh, if you remember uh, the talk yesterday, we have to be very careful about the, the alignment between the layers because it's, uh, this angular alignment changed a lot the electronic band structure and it changed a lot uh, your periodic potential. So it, it might also affect your topological curve. So that's why we decide to perform the same kind of experiments by layer graphing aligned with bottom eye type. Just at this time, uh, well, the aim of our uh, work was to make sure we are in a fully aligned position. So sorry. To make sure we are in a fully aligned position, we took uh, devices that we know how to build. These are dynamically rotatable van der Waals structures where we have a whole bar made of graphene. This is exposed graphene. And we cap these uh, whole bars with an hexagonal boronitride layer. And we move, we change the alignment of this uh, boronitride layer just by using an atomic force microscope. So this is the real picture of our device. What we do uh, in this case is just perform some experiments at 300K where we're gonna continuously, we're gonna change the alignment uh, and perform transport measurements until we find the fully aligned position. So now if you remember yesterday's experiment at 300K, we could see the satellite peaks in monolayer graphy, which made uh, our life much <laughs> better, much simpler. In the case of bilayer graphing, it's not at all the case. Even when we are uh, fully aligned, we cannot really see a signature far than that, a strong broadening of this uh, direct peak. And even though uh, to distinguish between uh, very small angles at room temperature is uh, very complicated. So we decided to be uh, as aligned as we could and go down in temperature where we can really uh, see this uh, satellite peak. We perform this experiment for different uh, alignments, we calculate the Moray wavelengths uh, from, from the position of the satellite peaks in, uh, in voltage. And in fact, we were very happy because uh, we are able to change this Moray lens, uh, even in bilayer graphing, in a very reproducible way. We we were very happy. We placed ourselves in uh, the highest or the more aligned position. That's what well, the title of this is, uh, topological valley currents in fully aligned bilayer graphing. So we are very sure of our angle. And we are very sure that we have the, uh, the highest uh, degree of alignment that we can uh, achieve. So we went to low temperatures. We started at 10K just to test, uh, first to test our alignment and then to test our non-local measurements. Turns out non-local measurements are uh, quite difficult to do because it's a very, very small signal. Uh, nevertheless, we manage uh, with a little bit of effort. So here on the first curve, you can see our local resistance as a function of, uh, of the gate of the Fermi energy. We have a very strong direct peak and uh, small satellite peaks that can be seen a little bit better in this uh, zooming of the curve. So we also have here in red the non-local resistance and uh, the non-local ohmic resistance, which is just uh, using a van der Poel calculation of the ohmic uh, contribution to, the, to this uh, non-local signal. So we can see that the ohmic 
signal is very small, very low, which is very good because that means that our non-local signal is real, is there, and it's uh, it's coming uh, from the sample and not just or for, uh, from the opening of this energy gap and not just uh, from electrons or carriers being scattered back and forth. So we did. Uh, we can see that uh, around the charge neutrality point is the same behavior around the satellite peaks. I'm not showing it here just because it's uh, it's going to be very confusing having a black line in the middle. So here it's where uh, where the fun starts, let's say, or yeah, or where we think the fun starts. So in if you remember from previous uh, measurement, the non-local resistance was always follow, following very well the behavior of the local resistance, but it's not at all the case in, in, our, uh, in our samples. In fact, for the charge neutrality point, yes, it's following very well the behavior of uh, the charge neutrality point. However, for the satellite peaks, we're having a negative non-local resistance, the same uh, for the second satellite peak, we are having also a dip after the peak. So we start, of course, as an experimentalist, we start wondering, maybe we are not measuring this uh, in the right way. We perform these experiments using uh, almost every instrument uh, available to measure this. And uh, we figured out that, in fact, uh, yes, uh, that's, uh, that's a measurement it's uh, in, in reality, the non-local signal here in red, it's really changing its sign as we pass through uh, the charge, uh, through the satellite peak. And it's also having a dip in the charge neutrality point and having also uh, a change in sign in the second satellite. We, we start wondering, maybe we are not at fully alignment, maybe we have uh, a mix of angles uh, maybe we are just miscalculating our angle. So we perform some magnetotransport uh, measurements to extract the, a very accurate value of lambda of the more wavelengths, which is uh, for us 14.4 nanometers, with, so, which means that we are at zero degrees at the highest, uh, at the highest alignment possible. Uh, we can see, of course, that this is a an aligned system, we can see Hofstra butterfly effects where we have uh, the replicas of the Landau fans uh, at the two sides of the main Landau fan interfering with each other. And from these uh, ground oscillations, it's where we extract this uh, gap, which uh, goes very well with the calculation uh, of just taking the density where the satellite peak appears. So now, okay, uh, this seems uh, seems to be what we are looking for. So let's uh, let's see what happens. Uh, sorry, <laughs> I went in the wrong direction. Uh, so we performed some local measurements uh, just to characterize our sample. Uh, we only see one energy gap at the charge neutrality point. This is a log scale. Okay, please pay attention to that. Uh, we extract the activation gap at the charge neutrality point. Turns out to be a very small uh, energy gap. It's about the half of what was predicted by Moon in Koshina. We do not see any uh, energy gap at the satellite peaks. So we don't see this secondary gap. We can see that uh, this local resistance comes in two regimes, comes in a, in a thermally activated regime which kind of stops or stops around uh, 16 Kelvin and uh, after the lower temperatures than 16 Kelvin, we can see uh, more of a hoping regime. So it's a much slower, a much um, yeah, slower uh, regime. So, okay, well, we have an energy gap. We can, uh, we can have some uh, very curvature. And uh, here, we measure the we measure the non-local resistance to see uh, what is its evolution. So the first thing that uh, was very encouraging to us to tell us that uh, this change in the non-local resistance, strong change in the non-local resistance, was not just an experimental uh, 
problem is the fact that you can see a very well, uh, very clear dependence on temperature. In fact, you can see it. Uh, you can see that there are different regimes. A regime where you have a negative uh, resistance, a negative non-local resistance. A regime where you have a positive, just positive non-local resistance. Here, it's also maybe a little bit uh, more difficult to see, but you have the same effect. In this case, it's a little bit opposite because this shoulder of the resistance just gets flattened and then it increases. And, uh, and the one in the electron side behaves a little bit different. It only uh, reduces its size in both uh, directions. So, well, let's, uh, let's see how it behaves because this behavior is not so clear. It's not so easy to understand. So we decided to go for something that we know first, as a first step, and uh, we start measuring just the charge neutrality point to begin with. So when we measure the, the thermal activation or how is the behavior of this thermal, uh, of this non-local conductance as a function of the temperature, we can find two regimes. So we found a first regime with an energy gap of about 48 kelvins. And at about 40K, we have a change, strong change in the, in the behavior with a gap that seems to be larger. Uh, and uh, that stops again at 16K. And after 16K, we have the same behavior as uh, in the local resistance, just hopping. So very, very slow uh, decrease on the resistance, on the conductance, sorry. So, well, but this do not say much about the topological currents. But if we take the previous curve, if we take this non-local, this local resistance and this non-local resistance, of course, what we were very tempted to do is plot local versus non-local and see if we have a cubic relation. And uh, in fact, that's the case. Uh, we can see uh, about the same behavior as for bilayer with uh, an applied displacement field. We can see that we have a saturation regime where the just uh, the non-local resistance do not change anymore, and a, a, a very clear and very well defined uh, non-local resistance depending as the cube uh, yes power of three with a cubic relation of the local resistance. And then a second part of this uh, curve, which seems to be quadratic. So the first, uh, the first question is, what is happening here? Why do we have uh, three regimes? So last time we saw a paper about bilayer, there was only two. Now we are having the three regimes. What are these three regimes about and how can they uh, help me to understand what is happening around the satellite peaks? So for that, what we, uh, what we can say about that is uh, the following. If we plot just uh, the temperature dependence of the non-local resistance, in a very, uh, let's say, smooth uh, map. And we also make very clear where are our uh, different regimes. We observe two things. In the first, in the higher part, from 40 kelvins up, we do not really see any behavior that is strange to us. We only see a non-local resistance. We always See, uh, this is uh, maybe something uh, very important that I forgot to mention before. Uh, we always see a non-local resistance, even at uh, 300K. And uh, the importance of this comes uh, from the fact that if we can see this non-local resistance up to high temperatures, and if the origin it's, uh, it's topological if uh, this signal is at 300K is really coming from the opening of the energy gap. This opens a, a clear way to future applications in, uh, in bioelectronics. It's why it's so uh, important, let's say, to observe this uh, up to high temperature. Anyway, so 
we can see that uh, there are no non-local uh, resistance. And even at high temperature, we can observe this uh, non-local resistance, at least a non-local signal that is quite strong, especially at uh, the charge neutrality point here. This curve has been cut just for the sake of clarity to see uh, these two peaks uh, better. But this non-local resistance, in fact, it, I think there is a question. Santiago? Yes, there is a question in this plot. Do we know roughly about K? BT, how KBT compares to the size of the energy gap? I, I, I mean, here it's, well, you have, so thanks for the, for the question. The first thing is, uh, it seems that we have two energy gaps. So it seems that the gap of the, of the local, given by the local resistance, uh, it's something about 22K, okay? At the gap of the non-local resistance, it's much greater than that. This was exactly the same case uh, for the first bilayer measurements. They observed the same, they observed a gap in the non-local resistance that is much stronger than the gap of the, uh, of the local resistance. And this is just attributed to uh, impurities. So. In the non-local resistance, you are less prone or less sensitive to disorder and inhomogeneities in your sample. And that's believed to be the origin of uh, having a better resolution in your, uh, in your energy gap, not necessarily having a larger energy gap, but uh, a better resolution, a better way to extract your energy gap. That's the, that's the accurate. Uh, way to say it is so uh, about your question, how you know, roughly KVT compares to the size of the energy gap. I, I'm not sure that I understand where do you want to go uh, with that question. So I might be a, it might be a little bit uh, difficult for me to, to answer. Uh, what I would like to, to say or to add to this is that in at least uh, and if you want to compare the temperature that we have to the temperature of uh, these two gaps, it's a little bit, uh, I mean, I, I, I don't have quite the right words to say this, but uh, let's say that 70K, if you want to compare 70K here, we don't see any special effects, uh, neither to 22, neither to 22k. But I don't think that's the right way to to do it, comparing the gaps with uh, the temperature in uh, in this uh, system right now. But nevertheless, uh, what I was saying. So okay, uh, we have these two uh, temperatures where uh, we observe from which we observe changes in the behavior, okay? And we have a cubic relation in between these two, 12 and 40, okay? If we plot uh, roughly where they are, uh, 12, uh, 12 and 40, K, we can say many things about uh, the system. For example, this uh, dip in the non-local resistance uh, that we saw from the beginning that I have been talking about uh, for a long time, in fact, it develops uh, for temperatures lower than 40K. You can see it here in, in blue. It starts developing for those temperatures. And for temperatures lower than uh, 12 Kelvin is where we can start to see the second minimum in the, uh, this second dip in the non-local resistance. So it seems to be a, a clear relation uh, between the range in which we can observe this uh, cubic relation, the range in energy or uh, in temperature that we can observe this cubic relation and the appearance of these uh, uh, dips in the non-local resistance of the satellite peaks and the charge neutrality point. Now, if you see it, maybe this will be a, too much of a hand wave uh, argument, but I'm just looking for a good uh, design that I forgot to put in the, in the last part. 
So if, if you think that uh, this is a picture that we are having, okay? We inject electrons in this side, okay? Electrons going with one valley will go to the right, going with the opposite valley go to the left, and then we have a charge accumulation in this side, okay? And we are measuring just our regular voltage. The way we measure voltage uh, in these systems is this voltage minus this voltage that gives you your signal, because one of them will always be the reference. Now, this is what happens if you inject electrons, but if you inject holes, the opposite will happen. And that's exactly, so the, when I say the opposite will happen is that your charge accumulation will be in this electrode, which means that your non-local signal will be inverted. And that's exactly what is happening here. We're having an inversion of the non-local, of our non-local resistance. So this is just a change in the charge carrier uh, nature, uh, which is suspected which is also what we see at the charge neutrality point. Now the question, the real question that we haven't solved uh, so far and that we unfortunately don't have a, a good answer for uh, yet, it's so why this dip is not more pronounced if we are injecting electrons and, uh, and holes in the, same, in the same way, why this is not more symmetric? Maybe we will need to go to lower temperature to solve that question. We don't know yet, but uh, it seems pretty clear to us that we can explain where, uh, what's the origin of this non-local uh, resistance, negative non-local resistance. This might be a, a real proof of this uh, chirality dependent non-local uh, resistance at full alignment. We also need to, to know what happens to other alignments, uh, but so far we are, uh, very happy and, uh, and uh, very, uh, I don't know what's the word in English, but uh, let's say that we are very happy to, to recover uh, a dependence that, sorry, a dependence of, uh, a cubic dependence of the non-local resistance and uh, to be able to explain this uh, negative non-local uh, resistance. So with that, I would like just to, Thank you for your attention. I know I went a little bit fast, but uh, I mean, when you are online, it's very difficult to control the time for me. So sorry about that. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, let me see if there are questions in the Q&A box. There are no questions here. I think so. Yeah, I actually have a couple of questions. Can I ask you? Sure. Yeah, so one is a more technical one. How do you change the local resistance to measure the no local resistance? Uh, it's I mean, you, just you, the... You have yeah. a device, right? Just one device. And in that device, you change the local and you measure the non-local? Yeah, so it's... Uh, for the moment, it's just a manual system. So these devices, they go this at low temperature. So you have lines they go to high temperature and uh, at high temperature, you just have uh, pins to connect mm -hmm. and uh, you just have to change how, what's your configuration. It's uh, it's just disconnecting wires and reconnecting. Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> the, uh, the local resistance, I mean, it's just a function of the length of the, your- No, no, no. So local and non-local, uh, maybe this is not the best um, uh, picture to show that, uh, I think I might have uh, one that is much better in, uh, let's say this one, okay. So uh, local, it will mean that you apply the current here, mm -hmm. drain it here, and measure between these two. This means that uh, your voltage drop is across a section where the current is flowing. Mm -hmm. Okay, while the non-local, it means that uh, the flow of carriers, it's far away from uh, the place where you are measuring. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the difference between uh, these two, it will be only which electrodes you use to inject and which electrons you use to measure your, your voltage. Oh, okay, 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 okay. Yes. Yeah, okay. 
And the other question is somehow something, uh, or I am lost in this uh, topological summary school and twisted things. Um, do you think that phonons play a role in all of this uh, low energy physics? I mean, or do you expect some kind of a phonon effect in the, uh, depending on the twisting between one uh, and the other? Because you, you, you showed a lot of change yeah. in this non-local resistance as a function of temperature. Yes. Uh, I don't know if uh, some other- Well, uh, it depends on, on uh, I mean, I am not sure that, uh, that that the temperatures that we are uh, measuring phonons will uh, play a role. And especially, I'm not sure that they will uh, impact this uh, local or non-local uh, measurements or, or uh, what I'm trying to say is I'm not sure that they will impact your uh, topological uh, behavior. Mm -hmm. There is uh, probably a phonon contribution at higher uh, temperatures, but uh, at the temperatures, where we are measuring at 10K, there is uh, for sure no more contribution of phonons in, uh, in graphene. The, maybe the question is a little bit more uh, complex of that because it's uh, phonons on graphene, no, but phonons maybe on hexagonal boron nitride or uh, even maybe on the more super lattice when graphene and BN, they are completely aligned. You have uh, one system, uh, the graphene is stretched so maybe you can find some phonon contribution there, but I'm not sure that it will be, that it, it will give you a, a real signal to measure at, in this particular experiment. Okay. There is a question in the Q&A. Uh, can the asymmetry between the positive and negative uh, RNL, so I think it's non-local resistance. Non-local resistance. Yeah, non-local Be partially related to a different effective mass of electrons and holes. Uh, yes, uh, that could be uh, something to look into, uh, but but uh, I think they are not that uh, different for uh, well at, at least not in the numerical. Uh, in the numerical simulations, they don't look uh, that different, but uh, for sure, it's something to look into. Uh, in, I mean, it's something uh, to look into in terms of, uh, we could measure the effective mass. This effective mass uh, will affect our valley semen uh, splitting. And uh, this is something, uh, it, this is something that should, I think it should be symmetric about, uh, around. I mean, I think the masses are symmetric, but I'm not sure. It's uh, yeah, it's a very interesting question. It's uh, definitely something to to look into. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And no more questions. Let me check this last channel. Mm -hmm. There is nothing for you. Yeah. So I think. Uh, thank you again, Rebecca, for thank being you, with us this week. And, uh, I think there, yeah. there's a question, uh, but uh, you want, you want? no, 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 I no, it works. I, I have a, a last question if uh, if I'm allowed. Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, it's a curiosity actually. Like uh, when you show this yeah. very nice uh, system where you can rotate your top mm -hmm. layer for a nitride, right? And um, <clears throat> you do it with the FMT, right? Yes. You do it by applying force or by applying voltage? Force. We push, uh, we push in these little arms. In fact, I, I took this picture that is not the best because the handle is not completely on top of the whole bar, just because uh, after you push, uh, you damage a little bit the arms. So it's not as beautiful. <laughs> that's uh, just a cosmetic uh, thing. Uh, but that's all what we are doing. We're just uh, pushing, literally just pushing with the AFM. Yeah, and that's an AFM bitter, right? So yes, I guess you can. You need to control the force you use for imaging, and and then you need to apply some extra one to to shift to, to rotate. So. Uh, yes, the so the technique is it's quite simple. So in principle, uh, you just have to push, and if your if your force it's enough, it will uh, it will move. Uh, the trick in here is that. Uh, 
what does it mean that your force is enough? Because uh, the friction forces between these materials increase uh, when they are aligned. When they are close to alignment, they increase. So what is a little bit tricky to do is finding this, uh, like the good positions, like here. Like uh, making a very small change between two of these is, uh, is, can be very tricky because uh, the force that you need might be uh, too high. Uh, so when you try to go there, you just move it too much or you just pass off the other side. So it's a long experiment uh, to select the good angles, but it, it, yeah, it, it's just a matter of getting used to it, I guess. All right, thank you. No more questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you for being here this week with us. And I hope to see you next year in here in San Sebastian. Sure. Okay, let's see, let's see if the, the pandemic allows us to, to do this in life. Yeah, life in here in San Sebastian. And so with uh, Rebecca in this last talk of the afternoon, we close the session and we encourage everyone to meet up again next Monday with a new lineup of uh, speakers uh, yeah, Monday at 2.30 European time. So thank you very much again and see you. Ciao. Thank you.